everybody doing? Everyone having a good week yes. so far? All is well? Yes. All right, good. <laughs> uh, all right, so, uh, so one thing, I, I'm, since a lot, I think most people have seen uh, some version of a presentation on Shift before, I, we, we wanted to not be repetitive and really perhaps highlight some things that maybe we haven't talked about before. And one thing that we haven't really focused on is the idea of conscious capitalism. I'm not sure if that's a familiar term to everybody, but it's a, uh, a movement that has been um, prevalent for the past 15 or so years. And I had heard about it, and I read the book called Conscious Capitalism, and uh, managed to get, I applied to attend their CEO summit in 2017. And it was really uh, a watershed moment for me in the idea of like I had found my people. And this, this group of, of business people that was really operating at a high level, like I was really like a, I felt like a, like a small entrepreneur there. There were like publicly traded company CEOs there and, and uh, but had this um, commonality of people who were, uh, who were operating real serious businesses that had a mission to have a positive impact at the same time. So um, uh, the, the basic philosophy of conscious capitalism is, um, is to combine a social mission uh, with a profitable business model. And so that's, if it wasn't obvious, what we're, what we're doing here. And, and uh, the reason is that, uh, the, the, the thesis is that philanthropy by itself is not going to be enough to solve the world's problems. I think we're seeing that today. There's certainly, and, and I'm a huge believer in philanthropy. I've been involved in philanthropy my, my entire life, but uh, we need more than that. And the idea for a model like Shift is that we, if we create a business model that's actually more profitable uh, and has a positive social mission, the fact that it has the, um, the social mission may not even some other developers may not even care about that. And they may copy the model and they want to do something similar. So if people say, oh wow, building a community structure and community focused development it actually could make more money or having regenerative agriculture in your project could make more money and they copy that. Even if they don't care about the environment, if they don't care about people, something positive is going to happen uh, because we're showing the better business model. Uh, we obviously care a lot about those things, but but uh, that's the uh, um, that's the the theory and, and our belief behind why um, why we love conscious capitalism. Um, so uh, for those that aren't don't really know totally about my background, I've been a real estate developer for 25 years. It's pretty much um, besides a two-year stint in banking right out of college, this is this is what I've always done. I, I started off on my own, uh, very small, and buying an apartment. And, uh, and the timing was very fortuitous and fixed it up and then bought another one and sold those two apartments and bought my first building in 1999 in Manhattan. And that's how everything really, um, really started. And I was fortunate enough to find some some success at a early, you know, in early years when I was still young, and um, and fortunate not just of you know finding success, but also young enough where I was looking at a trajectory, and um, and I and it forced me to ask some questions. And the main question was that I was experiencing was if I continue on this path, uh, will I be happy? And so. Um, so this particular um, apartment was one that I, um, I did a lot of design work myself and, and I lived there. I was sort of like the ultimate bachelor pad. It was, it was written up um, in the front page of the New York Times home section and published all around the world and won design awards. And it really had everything I could possibly want. Um, and, and, I, you know, and I had that in my early 30s and it was, and it was um, but begged the question, well now what? Now, like, what am I, I was always working towards that, and now I had it. And it was like, okay, now what am I, I have nothing to work towards. And that's when my priorities really shifted and wanted to really focus on work that had, um, um, 
where social mission was much more of a priority. It was also a real lesson um, in, in, um, in the use of spaces. So I had this rooftop penthouse and, and um, I almost, I felt like a little guilty that it didn't get that much use. I actually felt like this responsibility to like invite people over all the time and experience it and have events there and I would throw charity events and let people just use it and, um, and which was actually also kind of exhausting. Um, so uh, it felt wasteful, I guess, in a way. And that sort of, that experience is, is, is part of why what we're doing at Shift is we're taking the best spaces and we're using them uh, as amenities so that everybody can share them and enjoy them together um, rather than just uh, one wealthy buyer uh, buying the best space and using it only, only occasionally. Um, so um, I'll just let you guys read that for those that haven't seen it before. Um, uh, I think you kind of know about it already. We can keep going. Um, so you often hear us talk about our values. You've, you've heard them before. We've mentioned them this week. And it is something that we, uh, we think about all the time on our, our team and how we, uh, how we show up uh, for our work and in life as well as, as um, uh, how we look to attract people for the project. So, uh, I'm going to run through them again, but this time in maybe a little bit of a different way. Um, so interconnectedness, the idea that everything we do uh, impacts uh, everyone or everything else in some way. And uh, I think most people go through life in, in you know, really a more less conscious mindset than some in that not recognizing the impact of their, their actions. So as an example, there's a desk here. And it's made out of wood. It's probably local wood. And the idea of, you know, when Lagarta made the decision to purchase this desk, that has an impact on all sorts of different things. It has an impact on the, uh, the carpenters who built it. It has an impact on where the wood from this desk came from and, uh, and whether or not there were any, um, you know, what was used to treat it, whether it was natural, whether it was chemical, what happens with the waste of that. Um, and... Um, um, and, and this is just a little desk. So I think most people go through life and they're consuming things, they're doing things, and they're not really recognizing the impact that um, every action they, they do has on other people and on the planet. And so that's you know, one of the things that we want to try to uh, you know, reinforce. Um, environmental stewardship. Um, uh, we hope you see that you know everything that we do is in our in our planning, in our um, um, in our building, in the way we operate as a community. Uh, this is at the forefront of of how we think about it. Um, Self inquiry, and I'd like to give the example of of uh, for me this project has called on me to to really learn a lot of things about myself that that I thought I knew. And you know, I, was, I had my business in New York. I did well with it. I knew how to be the leader. I knew how to manage people. I knew how to. And then I got here, and I, uh, I actually made a lot of mistakes. And um, I, I was actually uh, not totally sensitive to the differences between operating in a, uh, a, a Costa Rican culture when I was trained to operate in a New York City real estate development cult culture. They are so different, and I didn't know that. And so for me, that really took a level of self-inquiry and really, and, and, and humility of learning like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm messing up. Like, I'm making some mistakes here, and I have to do some things different. And so, um, uh, you know, we want to instill that on all of our team members and all of our community members as well. Um, accountability. Uh, an example, it, it, the idea of accountability is really, first and foremost, I always say, doing the things that you say you're going to do. Um, it's also us all being accountable for our actions and, and taking the responsibilities that we, uh, that we need to take. And uh, we had a recent uh, situation with a community member where they had uh, come to La Siembra, it was a founding member, and their behavior actually turned off a lot of people. 
And, um, and it was, you know, we obviously don't want to have to deal with things like that. And that's not, um, those things are, you know, messy, but we felt a responsibility to, um, to address it. And, um, and we went through a, a process with our community committee and uh, um, uh, they voted to actually ask this community member to withdraw from shift. And, um, you know, that it wasn't fun and nice or, you know, we didn't certainly want to do that. Um, somebody who had already invested money as well and we offered to return their money with a return, they accepted it. And, um, but we feel that's our responsibility. It's the only time it's happened, but we just give that an example that um, we're not just, you know, saying, hey, we have these principles and we want to attract great people. Um, we actually have a responsibility that if somebody is acting in a way that is not going to benefit the community, that we have to take measures to make sure that our community um, stays robust and, and with really wonderful, great people. Um, generosity. So um, uh, I'll give the example of, um, so Steph has been leading La Siembra this week and for the last several months. And, and Hannah has been brought on to, to, um, to help her and work together. And these guys have really done an amazing job. Um, and they, I have, you know, Shift has an agreement with, with both of them in terms of like the hours they work. And, and um, I, I, I have little doubt they've way exceeded their, you know, their hours and, and, and our, our previous agreement. And, and never at one point have either of them come and said to me, hey, you know, I'm working a lot more, you know, a lot more hours than we had thought. And, you know, I think we need to address this and, and you know, maybe we have to talk about, you know, finances a little more. Um, they haven't said that because, and I know they're not even thinking that because that's their, their nature. They're just, they're generous. They're generous in spirit and they want to do a great job. And, and, um, and so um, really embodying generosity. And what that does, you know, for me as, you know, as, as uh, a, a leader here is that gives me an opportunity as well. That gives me the opportunity to now practice generosity with them and say, hey, you guys have done an amazing job. And you didn't even ask for extra money. You deserve a bonus. So, Steph, you deserve a bonus. We'll talk about that. Uh, so, but the thing is, if they're constantly just, if they're not practicing generosity, it actually deprives me from the, um, the ability to, to be generous on, on, on my side as well. And so that's just an example of how, um, um, you know, how we like to operate and how we're looking to attract community members as well. Um, this is probably not, um, probably a good time to also mention that we're going to be, um, uh, we're, gonna, we're going to be unveiling a plan for all the shift uh, full-time staff members to have a profit sharing interest in the project itself. So, um, you know, that's our way, you know, um, as you know, it's at the top, we want to be generous with the people who are really uh, helping and, 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 and having a big impact on what we're, we're putting forth with the, with the initiative. Um, um, play, so uh, um, uh, let's see, uh, Wiley caught a, uh, when I wasn't looking, a, a, a Instagram, would ended up on Instagram, a video of me getting off my quad, and, and I, I ride around town here with a, um, with a helmet cover in my quad that's a cookie monster, and it's a, uh, it's like a furry head that, and um, sometimes people, they like, oh, that's you, I've seen that around, that's you, you're the, and, you know, people don't expect that, I think, from somebody that is, um, you know, that's leading an initiative, <laughs> so, um, and I, you know, I guess that it's another way, I mean, I just like having fun, it, I like that it makes people smile, um, and, you know, if it can make somebody's day a little, just a little bit, then that makes me happy, but it's also, I think, you know, we want to lead, I want to lead by example of not taking myself too seriously and making sure that we're having fun in everything we do, and we want that to be the case with everything we do at SHIFT. We have obviously serious work, but we want to enjoy ourselves, um, particularly when we're in such a, a joyous place. Um, so, uh, yeah, a little bit about our background. I've kind of touched on this already. Um, um, but, yeah, Costa Rica is the third country that we're 
we've been operating in. And um, I've done, you know, throughout my career, a, a series of very creative and call it non-traditional projects. This would be the, the highest um, level of complexity in terms of all the different pieces of having to, um, to put together. Um, but it's actually easier in some ways uh, in that it's not, you know, we don't have a lot of debt. We're not highly levered. Um, if it takes a little longer, that's okay. It actually gets a little better, unlike doing projects in New York. Um, so anyway, just a little bit about our background. These are all um, other projects that we've done. Um, and um, I think you guys all know about Nosara at this point. Um, and um, you know why we're, we're here. Uh, Ginger and I looked at a lot of different uh, uh, beach towns in Central America, and, and you know we chose this, which for the reasons that are probably obvious to all of you at this point. Um, and so you, you, you saw the site, and I, and I thought it would be good just to see it on the map. So we, we came in on this way, and this is our easement road here, and then this is our other exit through La Delicias. And we, we'd like to show this just to show, strategically speaking, of how, um, how convenient it is. So uh, people who live up here, actually, if, if this were a public road, this would be the quickest way for them to get to Guiones. We don't, we don't want it to be a public road. We don't want to have a lot of traffic. Um, but um, but it's, you know, it is very convenient of, the, of being quickly able to go to Nosara as well if you want to go to uh, Liberia or San Jose or Nicoya or even Garza. You can go out this way. And, um, and this whole area up here um, is, uh, there's a lot of planned development. It's all, uh, as far as I know, all of it is under agricultural zoning, which means they're very large lots. So it's never going to be something that is particularly dense, but we are going to have certainly more homes up there. And we are the closest development in Esperanza or Delicias uh, to, to here or to Playa Guiones. But because we have this easement road, uh, you know from being on the land the other day just how quiet and private it feels. Um, okay. Um, I'll just let you guys see this for a second, just the, you know, kind of the overview of the project. We actually just changed this. We've been saying for a long time 70% land preservation. And um, now that we're getting through more of our planning, um, we realize that we can achieve at least 75%. And after we do more planning, we, we, we probably will change it to 80 or even 85%. And, um, and people are often asking us like how many units we're gonna build. And the answer is we're not sure yet. And that's partly because we're gonna see how our planning goes. But this is just an element that we want to, um, that we're committed to a, a, in terms of like, so people know that we're um, we're not going to build on every inch of our land, which is what you do see happening in a lot of this area where Ginger and I live. You know, people are putting houses and guest houses and rental casitas on, on every little, you know, uh, spot of land. And there's, you know, there's no more trees for monkeys and, and, um, and you know, the economics, uh, you know, uh, 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 support that. It, you know, people do it because it, it, it's making money, but we are really... Um, uh, planning this, and each lot that we have actually comes with its own regulations that we have a maximum amount of building that can go on each lot. And so for our smallest lots, um, the, the, uh, the coverage that you could actually cover is 35%. For the biggest lots, it's 7%. And then it's something you know in between for all the others. Um, and we've planned it that way um, just so it'll always be that way forever that people can't, um, as the economics and people get more money, they might want to build more rental units and we're just not going to, planning it now that to make uh, that not possible. So uh, this is our master plan and, and um, just to give you a sense of, um, from a map version, so we came in here, this is the easement road and this is where the teepee is located we parked here, we walked around on this road here, and um, this um, neighborhood number 13, we've actually already planned. Um, and then we actually kept walking through um, uh, these two neighborhoods. 
um, up to this, and this is the area where we were sit sitting looking at the ocean. So just to give you a sense of where we are. And then um, um, this whole area is the farm. And then this is our phase one, El Pachote. This road actually has not been, um, has not been done yet because we're planning on selling all of this first. And um, we brought a model of it here. This is just um, uh, uh, El Pachote neighborhood, and then which is actually right here. If you want to, this is a blown up version of this little part here. If you want to take a closer look later, um, and we've really designed um, um, each one of these hills as a mini neighborhood. So each neighborhood has its own shared amenities, and then we have three separate amenity spaces, or four, sorry, that are shared by everybody. So this is, just as an example, one of the smallest neighborhoods. This is going to be our next phase, and that might just be about uh, six homes there. But those six homes will still share a common area right in the center that is a, uh, a shared swimming pool and a, a, a communal, like, living, cooking, um, uh, a communal sort of shallow. Uh, outdoor uh, living area. And every one of the neighborhoods will have something like that that is just for those neighborhoods. Then separately, we have a separate amenity uh, area for really this whole half of the neighborhood um, right here, which we'll show you on the map, the bigger, the blown up map in a second. Um, and so that's the common areas for this El Pachote, the biggest neighborhood we have but it's also planned to be for really this whole side of the property. Um, as we start developing this side here, we've planned a separate, um, even larger uh, amenity hub or clubhouse here that uh, this will be large enough to have, a meant to have events or um, programming for the entire community. Then we separately have, um, this is where we walked, where I think, we, I, think I mentioned these two amenity hubs are, are you know, family friendly, family focused. This one is just for adults. We're calling it El Sanctuario, which um, uh, we want to have a, a spa facility there, an event space. That's a place where um, we could throw a, a small party. Um, and uh, it's, it's, you can't drive to it. You have to walk a little ways because we want it to feel you know, more really natural and private and have a beautiful view. And then um, right here, this is another high point on the property, which I can point to at that little edge of the map of the uh, model right there. And um, that we plan to have a, um, um, a, a maloca or a, a, um, um, uh, a separate sort of sanctuary space where if somebody wanted to have a, med um, a medicine ceremony or have um, just you know, a place for meditation, and that's another place that you have to walk to it's really, there's nothing else really around it, and it's um, kind of like feels really in, in the jungle. Um, so that's another shared amenity for the whole community. Um, and so this is just showing the same map, but in phases. So this is phase one, but we actually have separated into A and B. So this is 1A here. This are all the lots and homes that we're selling now. Once those are sold, then we're going to do 1B, which is this road here. And the reason that we do that is we want to concentrate construction activity in a particular area. So we are encouraging everybody to, um, to, uh, to build early. And, and uh, I'm just realizing this is an old map. So these lots are a little different than what we ended up with. But don't, don't look at the lots. Just look at the phases. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we, we want to plan this so that people aren't forever living in a construction zone. We want to you know, concentrate construction activity in one area. So our plan as of now is we're not even going to start selling this until most or all of, of A is fully sold out. And we actually have, um, um, we have a requirement uh, that everybody, once you buy a lot, that you have to finish building a house within three years. And if you don't, you actually have to pay additional um, maintenance fees um, just to encourage people to we're, we're not looking for speculators we're not looking for people that want to just buy land and, and and they probably would make money to buy this land at an early stage in the project and then resell it later on to somebody else to build a house but 
that's not, you know, we're looking for people that want to be a part of the community and that are ready to build a house. So, um, oh, sorry. So, yeah, th then we're going, this would be the second phase here. And then we're actually going to move over to here. And really, this is our largest phase. Um, and then uh, phase four is access through this road here, these, um, these three neighborhoods. And then this is the whole um, commercial zone or shift village that we talked about, which we would we'd plan on building uh, closer to the end, although we are in talks uh, currently with a Montessori school that um, needs a new home, a local school here. And um, we are, Void is actually laying out uh, space for them to be right here on this side of the road. And um, we have someone that is looking for a hotel partner for us that would look to build a boutique hotel um, right over here. So, um, you know, those, if we work out those agreements sooner, that would start sooner rather than later, but we would build the rest of the commercial area um, a, little bit, a little bit later. So this is El Pachote, and um, we named it that because uh, if you didn't see the other day, there's a big, huge, beautiful pachote tree right here. We were trying to figure out how to squeeze a, a, a home in there without cutting it down, and it was, it's kind of short and fat and wide, so you couldn't really build a home. I love the idea of building a home with a tree in the middle of it, but we couldn't do that in, with this tree. So instead, we just decided to reserve it as a separate amenity area. And, um, uh, and so we'll build a, uh, uh, that's, designed to be a quiet meditation or contemplation area, uh, very serene, that is kind of out in its own, separate from the rest of the amenities, which are all here. This we've, um, we've named La Colmena, which in Spanish means the beehive, which we, we named in part because we feel that's what it is. It feels this, this place where people you know, come back and pollinate and flutter and, and revisit, but also the design, which you'll see in a little bit, um, actually looks like a honeycomb. Um, so that's uh, La Colmena. And then these are all the different lots. And we really you know, designed and planned this to have a variety of different uh, sizes and price points for different people. So I think this number nine, I believe, is our smallest lot. Number 15 and 16 are our largest. And they range in size from about a little over 500 meters to a little over 5,000 meters. Um, and, um, uh, and everything in between. And um, uh, Carl, can I, am I, can I share? <laughs> I'm, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but um, uh, Carl actually just signed a contract to buy number 14. So uh, he'll be, he'll be uh, we're really excited to have him. And, uh, and, his, and his, his mother um, is buying number 11. So, uh, so we're going to have, uh, you know, we're really excited. An intergenerational family from our first, uh, our, our first um, and, and we have a couple of others that I think are, I was actually planning on announcing it now, but they said, Let, let's just wait a few. But yeah, we have uh, a couple others that I think are pretty much ready to go. And we've really, um, you can go to the next slide. Um, I'll actually go back, sorry. And just to be clear, what, so what these are are our house names. Uh, these are our first four houses that we've designed that you'll see in a few minutes. And we've actually um, uh, planned the lots where we think they make the most sense. And they're designed to be somewhat flexible, that they can be a little larger, a little smaller. They can go in a couple of different places. So we can somewhat customize houses for people depending on their size and their budget. Um, but we also are not going to get into uh, like the interior design uh, customization business. So you know we're really putting incredible effort into designing things that we think are 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 beautiful and interesting and thoughtful. Um, this is a little bit of our design palette, which the Void team brought with us today, and Ginger's been really uh, working very closely with them and putting forth a a vision for our interiors. Um, but if you say, uh, hey, I really want 
a different bathroom tile. Um, can you help me pick something out? We're not going to get into that. But what we, what we would do is just deliver a bathroom for you without any tile, and then you can find somebody to tile it yourself, and you can take care of that uh, for those that want a little bit more uh, of their own personal customization of their, their homes. Um, okay. Uh, so we're going to be introducing all these guys in a little bit, but we're, uh, if it's not obvious already, we care a lot about design, and we're really, um, um, really being thoughtful and, 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 uh, and, and, and putting a lot of effort into bringing in great people to help us uh, make everything that we build really special, which is not particularly common for community-focused development projects. I think the, these projects are so challenging just to, just to execute on any level that design often becomes the af afterthought. And it's just like, if we can just pull, pull together the financing and the organization and the administrative and the legal, uh, it's like, that's, you know, that's a huge success. We really are not stopping with that. We, we want to um, really have compelling uh, designs and everything that, that we build. Uh, so the, um, in terms of the architectural vision, our whole team spent um, working with Boyd and, and other firms a lot of time uh, pinpointing how we wanted this to be. And we, it was really a balance between, we didn't want to be a community where all the houses are the same. That seemed kind of boring. Um, yet we also didn't want to be a community, um, and we looked at some other examples where you know you had one type of house here right next to it another something very very different that and on their own they were actually maybe architecturally interesting but next to each other they didn't work well at all or maybe they weren't in context with the natural environment so we really worked hard to achieve a balance with that and what we came up with was that each neighborhood would have its own architectural style and so these are four different styles that we are planning to have tropical modern is really the most probably open and, and uh, encompasses a lot of different things and ideas. And so that's what we've, um, what, that's what we're putting forth for El Pichote, for our biggest neighborhood, as a starting point. Um, and then other, other um, neighborhoods will have other styles so that there'll still be variety within each neighborhood, but that each neighborhood um, will have some level of cohesiveness. And uh, yeah, uh, these are just some very preliminary drawings of um, what we're tentatively calling shift shop. And um, there we have a, um, a founding member named Evan Collier. Those who were here last year got to meet Evan. Uh, and Evan is a, an artist and a wood and metal working entrepreneur who's had his own shop in New York and another one in, in Hawaii uh, for a long time. And so uh, he's been helping us with some preliminary planning of our shop space. And part of the reason that we want to have this is because there are limited options here of getting very high quality, architectural quality, wood and metal uh, items, you know, furniture, things like that, custom uh, millwork, uh, as well as even building materials. So to be able to fabricate them ourselves is, is, and have control over the process and the quality and the creativity, uh, we've decided to build our own fabrication studio uh, in the farm air side of the project. And uh, we are, part of the reason um, we'll be talking more, hearing more about from Terraform, uh, we're debating whether or not another initiative that Ginger's been leading will be combined with it. So these are actually um, Evan's initial drawings, and you can go to the next slide as well, um, and just some inspiration of the way he's thinking. But we don't want to just build a utilitarian wooden metal shop. We want to build something that's going to be really inspiring and beautiful and really combining nature. And, uh, and Void is actually now going to take over and, uh, and come up with something that has never been done before. Uh, no pressure. So, uh, so we just wanted to sh share with you a little bit about the planning of that. Um, so uh, actually, let's skip this because I don't want to spoil Void's thunder. Um, so 
these are our, um, this is really our schedule going forward. Uh, we've been working on the project now for, we closed on the land about three and a half years ago. And I think we've made really great progress in terms of, of uh, it's an incredibly complex project. This is characterized as a horizontal condominium and in Costa Rica that uh, is very, very challenging and very complex and it's the reason that hardly anybody does those projects here. And we've, um, we bought this land and it had nothing. It had, you know, no, no utilities, no road, no, no, no anything. And, and we've had a incredible amount of approvals and, and things that uh, steps along the way that uh, were also complete, for me personally, completely foreign because I hadn't gone through this regulatory process having not developed here before. But we had the wherewithal to hire a very capable team and, uh, and we think we've done very well with our approvals. We've got all of our major approvals out of the way. Anything that we're waiting on now is really more administrative and uh, things have gone very well. And now we're at really the exciting part of, of getting ready to, to uh, you know, start, start building soon. Uh, so you hear the term regener regeneration or regenerative projects pretty, it's sort of a new buzzword that's replaced sustainability um, as something that's better. And, uh, and it is, in my belief, better. And it's thrown around a lot. People uh, call a lot of things regenerative that maybe some might argue of whether they're really regenerative. So we would like to tell you what it means to us. It means that we, uh, we purchase this piece of land. We view ourselves as stewards of this land as opposed to owners of the land. And our responsibility, if we want to do a regenerative project, is to leave the land better than when we got it. And that's the way we look at things. And, and it's not just the land, but an extension of the, the overall environment. Uh, our goal with SHIFT is to be what we, we call a carbon negative project, um, so that we're actually having a positive environmental benefit net net from everything that we do. The challenge is it's really hard to measure that, and that's something that in the, in the balance of this year we're really going to be focusing on because um, we don't want to just be saying stuff like that. We actually want to have, have as deep as an, of an understanding of it as we can, and, and we're working with Void uh, on that to, um, uh, so that um, you know, we can, and, and, and being really open, sort of open source about our measurement, our, our practices, and and um, you know the, the things that we're doing to to uh, hopefully make it uh, carbon carbon negative. Um, so I think we've kind of um, um, I'll touch on a few of these things. Uh, soil rejuvenation is something that I think you hopefully learned a little bit about um, uh, yesterday. And we're going to start testing our soil now and actually comparing the farm area with the area that we haven't touched yet just for the level of, of uh, organic and, and, and uh, nutrients in the soil. But, you know, we'll see where the tests come back. But we think we pretty much already know that we've really significantly transformed our soil already in just a few years of, of working with it. Uh, water is something that we, uh, we put a lot of effort into. I hope you learned a little bit about that and seeing the water bodies and the contour lines and the little dams that we built. And I didn't mention it before, but we bought in a specialty engineer from the U.S. that, that um, th th they specialize in making natural water bodies. So we, are, we have set a goal of establishing what we believe would be Guanacaste's first year-round water bodies. So these are water bodies that don't dry up in, the dry, in, the, in our long dry season. And that happens from you know, the, the planning of them for where they go, um, recharging them with, with wastewater from the homes. And then that same wastewater will be used for irrigation purposes as well. And that just provides a whole host of environmental benefits. More of the water goes back into the aquifer and replenishes it. More stuff grows around it. It improves the biodiversity of the whole area. It brings more uh, animals that look to drink the water. It brings more pollinators. And um, you know, there's, so that's something that we're really uh, excited about. Um, it, it's the thing that 
get Sam, like, I think probably the most excited about, uh, about the project. He's really uh, always asking me, when are we going to build them? Um, so, um, uh, and reforestation is something we've, uh, um, you know, you're seeing that yesterday, but we've been really focusing on the intensive farming area, but we view the whole project as a farm. And, and um, we plan on, on, you know, slowly moving that way on the project. Um, we don't want to do too much work on areas where we haven't built yet because we have a risk of, you know, planting baby trees that people don't realize are even trees and they get, they get killed. And, and so um, we're basically starting. But we do have, you know, years and years of reforestation initiatives that we're, that we're planning. Um, so I think we covered probably most of this um, uh, on your tour, but um, um, we'll just let you, uh, these vetiver was the ones that Sam was pointing out, these tall grasses that we, that we plant, and we just have planted so many of those. Um, and, and, uh, and I'm really excited that now we're going to start introducing animals. I, I, I was hoping they'd, the animals would be here before you guys arrived, <laughs> so you could, because you know, it's great to, great to see that. But uh, I think in the next couple of weeks, they'll be coming. Um, this is our farm team. We're, we're, we're missing, uh, uh, we were hoping to take a new picture yesterday or two days ago. We didn't get to it. But uh, missing um, uh, Saul, who just, who just joined. But these guys have been really amazing. and, and um, uh, you know they really they really take pride in their work and they've been really great and and uh, I think I mentioned the other day we've never had somebody quit we really try to treat them well um, we pay them more than sort of a going wage of what others would pay them um, and we're also offering them educational opportunities and and um, uh, a bunch of them took a course in syntropic farming this past year and. Uh, we, we, um, so, uh, yeah, they've been, they've been great. Uh, so yeah, these are actually, this is from, that's from La Siembra last year. Um, uh, uh, yeah, you, and so this is just talking a little bit about community living and, and, um, this is a, um, I think one of the nicer, um, co-housing communities in the United States, just a, an example of it, and I think I, those who uh, attended the talk about the benefits of community living the other day, as I said, we're not, we don't call ourselves co-housing, but there's a lot of similarities of co-housing. And, um, and you know, this is just the idea of like a philosophical, this is not a, a shift diagram by any means, but a philosophical um, planning tool of how uh, co-housing and community-focused housing is, uh, is developed. We are also planning, it's not in our first neighborhood, but for most of our neighborhoods, we are planning off-site parking and just to deprioritize automobiles. Um, but you can still drive up to your house to you know, drop things off, but that uh, we're not looking at cars all the time and it encourages people to walk more. Um, okay. Um, so this is another, um, for those that may have seen the, uh, the Netflix series, Wild Wild Country. Um, fascinating if you haven't seen it, by the way. This is really meant to be a joke. But uh, uh, we're not doing this, just for the record. Just want to make that really, cool, really clear. And, um, um, and then there's lots of different types of community living. This is, this was, this is a community living model. It's really the, uh, the guru-focused community living model. And, um, uh, and, and you know, we, we put it in as a joke, but also uh, just to be really clear that for, for me personally, my job with SHIFT is to lead the development and it's to set it up and incorporate best practices, uh, doing lots of research with an amazing team. And if our team does our job, uh, uh, SHIFT survives on its own and it's, it doesn't need us to continue and certainly doesn't need me. And so this is not a model where uh, you guys are buying into me personally and I'm going to be long-term leading this community and you, you hope that I will be noble and, and do good things. 
um, this is really a model that we're creating and there will be a point in time where development transitions into operation and the, and the community um, is managed by a board. Uh, Ginger and I at that point will just be uh, two community members. Uh, you know, maybe one of us will be on the board, but beyond that, there'll be, you know, four other people on a board and nobody's more important than anybody else. So um, we are a, you know, planned as a democratically organized and, and run initiative. Um, so um, I think um, what makes, there's a lot of different community projects that are, and a lot of them are actually being planned in Costa Rica and, and in the Nosara area, and we're really happy to see that, that, that Costa Rica is, attract, is attracting people who want to both organize or be a part of intentional communities. Um, I, I think there's two things that make SHIFT unique, and, and one of them is that we really are focused on, on the people that we attract. And just like the example that I gave earlier where we asked, had to ask somebody to leave, we're not just looking to sell real estate. And um, you know, there's a lot of easier ways to sell real estate than the way we've been doing it. Uh, but we really are, uh, and that's also part of the reason that we've been going a little slower. And we attract a really core nucleus of, of some of Ginger and my closest friends, who many are not here for this last Siembra um, because they've come twice already. But, um, uh, but that provided um, really a foundation for which to build off of. And now we're building off of, and now through our amazing marketing team, we are attracting other people and some that we don't know. But when you come to an event like, like La Siembra, there already is a, um, a history that's of how the event uh, happens, how people act, and that grows on, e on itself and will continue. And our job is to continue to be really thoughtful about um, the people that we attract and to have a vetting process that each, each person that wants to be a part of SHIF uh, gets to know us, meets with our community committee um, so that we can uh, make sure that we're, we're, um, we're, we're a high, highly functional and wonderful group of people. Um, yeah, so these are just some of our community members. Um, you know them at this point. Uh, this is Lane. He couldn't make it this year. He was here the last two years, one of our closest friends. And um, um, yeah, that's more for people that haven't, haven't met uh, some of our community members. Here's, here's from La Siembra last year. It's funny, I feel like we'll have just this collection of photos. Thank you for your patience in taking this picture the other day. Thank you, Shauna, for capturing it every year now. Um, but maybe someday we'll have this collage of pictures of, uh, of every year and we can see how we're all getting older sitting in and, uh, you know. Um, uh, so we wanted to just highlight some of our, our social impact um, um, initiatives. And so some of these have been, um, we've had a lot to, a lot of balls in the air to move the project forward over the last couple years. And there are some of these initiatives that we started and we got bogged down with other things and then we're restarting. And so, um, uh, but we, it certainly is a commitment of ours that we're, we're continuing with. Um, the water bodies we actually started really early. That was something that, that Sam really uh, ran with and, and has been great. Um, the 10% uh, the uh, of our, we're, we've committed 10% of our profits to, um, uh, of the project for not-for-profit groups. There'll be prim primarily local groups. Um, we, we just haven't had time to decide exactly who they're going to be yet, but we always announce it. It'll certainly um, is a commitment that we're making. And, and even with our first, the closing of our first lots, um, we're planning on making a donation, uh, even though we don't have profits yet, it's a, an advanced payment on the profits that we know we will have to, um, to uh, some, uh, it may be the local schools in our neighborhood, uh, our two neighborhoods. We still have to work that out, but um, uh, that's something that we're certainly committed to. Um, yeah, we are a sponsor of the Nosara Civic Association, which does a lot of great work uh, with the planning and, and 
in helping to uh, secure a great future for Nosara. They've, they've already done a lot of wonderful things. Um, we started our composting program this year where we, uh, you probably heard yet on Wednesday, we go to the restaurant Mala Crianza, which is nearby. We, they give us all their compost and, and we're, uh, you know, uh, I think a, a lot of restaurants here, they just, they feed their compost th to pigs and that's, and that's, and then they, they sell pigs, but you know, pigs fart a lot and that puts off, um, uh, you know, gas that put, that produces net carbon. So we're doing something that we think is more positive. And it's also cool that they buy our platinos and then we take the peels back and put them back in the garden. So it feels kind of like a, a great closed loop. And we also just love their food there. Um, the Growing Trees Together program is a program that we started whereby we donate up to five fruit trees to any local families uh, that want them. And the only thing that we require is that they attend two classes with us where they learn how to plant and then care for their trees. And so uh, that's one that we've had to put on hold just because we haven't had the staffing available for it, um, but that we're going to be restarting. And that we're envisioning as our main community initiative that we really want to grow for the whole uh, surrounding com community. And we love things that have like multiple benefits. So in this case, we are, are providing uh, uh, some small level of food security for people. We're, and it's organic food, obviously, and local food. Um, uh, and then we're also, um, uh, we're teaching people about uh, a lot of people, even though they live in this wild natural environment, they actually, there's a lot of people that, that, uh, that don't know how to garden or do, don't know how to grow fruit or grow food. And so we're furthering that knowledge. And then obviously we are, um, we're providing, you know, something that has an environmental positive impact and just growing more trees. And then we get to interface from the, with the community. So when we had our first, uh, our first major initiative on this. We invited all the families. We met with them. And we actually all sat around a circle and, and, and everybody just spoke for a moment. And it, was, it served as a community gathering that we were hosting and we really got to know them. And they were, they were really gracious um, that we reached out to them. And they said, you know, no one, you know, the foreigners that come here, they're not, they're not doing this. They're not ever, no one's ever reaching out to us. And they really appreciated it. And then from our side, it was just so great to meet them and to hear um, about some of the things that they're doing, and it's a real learning opportunity for us. So it's just one of these initiatives that has like seven different benefits and that um, we plan to continue with. Um, and, um, and the main thing, and so this is next on our list, is um, we're going to hire a, a full-time person. Uh, once we can catch our breath after, you know, it'll be in the next couple of months, hopefully, um, that is going to oversee all these initiatives and, and that can, uh, it will definitely be a Costa Rican um, person that, that will lead uh, the Growing Trees Together and a lot of other uh, programs. And then, um, and then education and research is the last piece that we really, we want to be a, a center for education and research, uh, whether that's internships, whether that's partnerships with, um, uh, with universities, it's something that we're going to be talking more about with, uh, we're doing a, a big group brainstorming session this afternoon with all of our design professionals and with Terraform. Uh, that's one, one of the things on our agenda of how we can make SHIFT a, a center for, for both thought leadership and for education, both at a high level and, and uh, things like the local schools and partnering with them. Um, so accessibility, I just, you know, we want you guys to know that this is something that we uh, are, are in our planning and our design work that we think about. It's, uh, and our, we have apartments that, that we're building that Void is going to be uh, sharing with you in a second. And they are all, um, every, every common area that we have that's multi-story uh, will be fully accessible. Um, we, are, we want our trails to be accessible. There's some areas that are just too steep that it's just not possible, but we just want everyone to know that we're thinking about this. Um, this is where Ginger and I would like to be old as well. And, and you know, uh, so we're thinking about ourselves selfishly, but we're also thinking 
uh, about just making a place where people can are able to age in place and in, in an environment that's really um, you know beautiful and tranquil, tranquil and, and nurturing. Um, so, yeah, this is just some things. I think you guys kind of know most of this already in terms of, um, um, I guess the one thing I will highlight is the, the private water concession. So water is very tricky and challenging in Costa Rica. Um, and because we're a condominium, there, there are all these local um, water boards in every neighborhood um, has one, or every, sorry, every town or village has one. And some of them are highly functional, some of them are highly dysfunctional. It all de 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 depends on the governance of that particular neighborhood. But because we're a condominium, uh, we actually can manage our own water. That's one of the, 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 the benefits of being a condominium. So we have to pay for the management and maintenance of it, but that's not a lot of money. But we have independence, and we don't have to rely on any, um, any uh, governing body for, for our water. Um, and uh, I talked a little bit about condominiums, and, and the, 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 there's, there's just a host of benefits in owning, in Costa Rica, owning in a condominium as opposed to other forms of property ownership here. But the biggest one that kind of encompasses most of it is, is governance, in that a condominium is able to be self-governed. Um, and able to enforce rules and regulations. And there's a lot of uh, community-focused projects in Costa Rica that are done under agricultural zoning. And they, they have all these rules and regulations and HOA fees and things like that. Um, but what uh, I think a lot of people just don't even realize is that they're not, they're not legally enforceable. They're, they're, you hope that people will follow them. And there's some examples in town um, one in particular in Guiones, where over the years, you know, people gradually started breaking rules, and then eventually the rules just went completely out the window, and uh, particularly around what you can build, and so uh, and there's no way to, to to enforce that. And once and people, I think, looked at it and said, well, if nobody else is following the rules, why should I follow the rules? And um, so that's one of the reasons that we are a condominium because. Um, it, it guards against that ever, ever happening. Um, so uh, we just went on sale with our lots really in the last you know, couple weeks. And uh, we're, 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 I guess we're officially still not on sale. We're, we're after La Siembra and we catch our breath is when we're going to do like more of an official announcement in our, in our various you know, marketing channels and things like that. We've just been sharing pricing with some people, um, you know, like Carl, who had expressed an interest. And, um, and uh, um, so we're just, you know, this is where we've, uh, where we're pricing everything. And these are um, really rough estimates of, of, um, of uh, home costs of where, you know, so we are, we're just to be clear, we're selling three different things. We're selling lots. We're selling uh, houses that we're going to be showing you in a moment, um, designed and built and delivered on a particular lot. And then we're selling um, uh, apartments, which we call Los Nidos or, or nests, and um, uh, you know, a variety of different price points. And our, our pricing strategy is we're, we're, pricing, uh, we're pricing lots in a way right now that we feel is, is really affordable. And really, you know, these are, we are we, and that's for a number of reasons. We're, we we have well, this is a big project, and this is the first stage of it. We want to get some some early momentum. We're actually using these initial lot sales um, as financing for other um, other phases of the project and infrastructure work. Uh, we also want to have as much selectivity as possible among the people that we attract and. And the lower you price it, the more interest you get. Um, and uh, and we want it to be value to uh, to the founding members who are or uh, many are deciding right now whether to convert their original investment to a lot or a, or a home purchase. Um, and uh, uh, so we've looked at you know the comps and comparable properties and everything else for sale in the neighborhood. 
And we feel that we're very, just forgetting about community, forgetting about our environmental initiatives, all the things we're doing. If you're just looking at plain real estate without amenities, we actually feel we're, we're comparably priced. And then on, on top of that, you know, you're getting the amenities that we've already, um, to date, we've, uh, we've probably spent about a million dollars on our farm when you factor in everything. Um, and so that's something that, you know, everybody, the community members will own the farm. And our initial budget for our, our phase one amenities is over $3 million. So that's something that developer, that us, we're fully covering. And that is owned by uh, all the unit owners. So, um, so you're getting that as well. So anyway, we, we're, we're, um, we're, and then on top of that, we're offering a 20% a discount to Costa Ricans on, on any lot purchase because we want to make sure that we have a project that uh, we have a meaningful amount of Costa Ricans um, included and not just a bunch of foreigners in somebody else's country. So uh, I hope, Ricardo, you don't mind sharing me sharing this, but, but um, uh, well, Ricardo's interested in, you know, possibly, hopefully living at Shift, and, and, and I'm hoping Felipe may, may still come around, we'll see. But uh, when I shared, um, I think you had an initial idea that, like, uh, it's going to be too expensive. And then when I shared the pricing, you were, you were surprised at how low it was. And so Ricardo, I, we had a presentation last week with about 12 of Ricardo and Felipe's friends from here in Costa Rica, um, and many who are interested and, 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 and uh, who are coming next week to, to look at uh, five, of them. five of them. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and I mean, Carl, I hope you don't mind me sharing that. Um, I think you looked at, you looked at everything prior to signing your contract, right? And I mean, you had looked all over every, um, for quite a while. That was the impression I have. And I, I actually haven't asked you, I don't mean, I, I'm putting you on the spot again. Um, what, how much of your interest was related to economics versus the community elements of it? I don't know if you, if you have a feeling of that. I mean, everything is, is related to my decision. Yeah. That's, that's a fine thing. I, I can verify exactly what you just said, that the pricing is, is uh, very comparable and even competitive in regards to everything that I've seen. I, I looked at like maybe, I don't know, 80 lots or something in every direction around. Good. <laughs> and yeah, you want to say something? <laughs> Which were the, I mean, what we're asking. Yeah, back then. Yeah. Where everyone right now is, is the basis yeah. still coming back. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and the other thing I'll share is those are the prices for now. Like, we're, we're, we are going to raise the prices as we sell more. And after we sell maybe even, you know, our first, you know, five to ten lots, the, if, if they sell quickly, we may actually may raise the prices that soon, but um, you know we want we want to get early momentum. We want to um, you know build a buzz and 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 uh, um, so we're very we're very transparent about that. And and I think a lot of communities. So uh, Jess Robertson is one of our advisors. She lived in La Ecovia in San Mateo uh, for six years, and that was you know an early. Um, some elements of shift, but certainly a community focus, um, uh, permaculture based uh, community project. And she bought early there and she explained to me that, that um, fast forward five years and the people who bought those first lots could sell them for three times what they, uh, what they paid because then the community was established, it, people knew what it was, it was something special and people wanted to live there. And, and obviously, this isn't a promise. I'm not saying that's going to happen with Shift, but I, I personally believe it will. I believe that we'll, we'll because I think our vision is bigger in a lot of ways. And, um, um, and so I, I do think it's an opportunity, and, and we were transparent about that. that and, and we are looking to appeal to a variety of different income levels as well. And we have some 
uh, even within our founding member groups. We have people who are uh, trying to save up to buy the smallest apartment uh, that we're offering, and we have people that could buy a house, you know, in the primest area of Guiones, right on the beach, but specifically want to live in community, and we have everything in between. But for those people that are more budget-minded, um, and this is what we tell our, our friends, that, that um, there's an opportunity to have something that's more affordable um, if you're, uh, and, and in general, if you're acting early, but in, in general, the, the, the people I, who invested early in this project as founding members, we feel are, are getting well rewarded in terms of their purchase credit now that it's all coming together and, and their purchasing power and their investment goes, goes pretty far. So uh, anyway, that's, that's all I'll say about pricing. Done, sales pitch is over on that part. Uh, I think, uh, well, here's the prices, but um, um, yeah, just to kind of give you a sense. And, and we can send this all to you um, separately and, and uh, anybody who's interested, you can talk to Sarah and she'll answer any, any um, questions you have. So these are just the lot prices right now. We are a month or two away to having the home prices. We're going to show you the homes, but we just haven't. Um, we're, we're, we're still working on them. We, are, we finish what's called schematic design of the homes, and, um, but we're not at a point where we can put a price on them quite yet. Um, and then this is our investment structure that we're offering. So this is different than how we started. And this is... Um, um, it, it's, we've changed from an equity instrument to a debt instrument. And so what we're offering, and for people who want to buy a lot or a home right now, we can just uh, do that and we have those to offer. We'll have the homes, as I said, shortly. But for those that want to be a part of a, the community, but maybe they're not ready yet, um, this is an option uh, for people to invest money with us now that will accrue a return uh, uh, until people convert that investment to a real estate purchase. So it would accrue at 12%. And, um, and so if you, say, invest $100,000, after one year you'd have 112, after two years you'd have 125, four, because of compounding. Um, and at any time you can convert that to a real estate purchase. Um, this is really a fallback plan that if you decide you don't want to purchase, that's not, we're not looking for lenders, we're looking for community members that want to join the community now. But if someone changes their mind or doesn't allow, um, we, we could, they'll still be a lender, but they would earn an 8% interest and we would just um, pay them back. So um, yeah, we have a term sheet and documents for this we can send you if anybody's interested. And this is just to show um, what Costa Ricans would earn um, um, uh, because they're getting an additional 20% uh, discount on their lot purchase. Uh, which, yep, yeah, recognize this guy. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I already covered this. Uh, and then financing. So people ask about this all the time. We are, um, we, we've talked to a variety of different lenders. This is something that's changed in Costa Rica in the past year. There's just a lot more financing available for home purchases for foreigners um, than there ever was before. Real estate in San Jose has gotten a little soft. Banks still want to lend, and they really view uh, beach and vacation properties as where they're interested in, in lending money. And so um, just a little bit. The, the, the terms used to be a lot more expensive than, than U.S. rates from those from the U.S., but with U.S. rates going up so, so much, it's actually not, it's not, and they've really stayed the same here. It's really uh, not that much different anymore. And I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs>